Hello. In this session, I'm going to talk about internal migration or stoping. The presentation will provide an overview of the internal erosion process of internal migration and discuss internal migration into open defects in foundations, conduits, and drains. First, I will cover the overview of the internal erosion process. Internal migration occurs when soil particles move or drop into an open defect. Soil particles that drop to the bottom of the void are carried away by seepage to an unfiltered exit. If extensive void space exists in coarse soils or bedrock, an open exit may not be needed, but sufficient storage space for eroded fine particles must be available. The process is repeated progressively, causing the void to enlarge and migrate vertically upward. Internal migration can also occur if there are open joints or defects in conduits, drains, or other structures that are not filtered, or if there are untreated rock defects in the foundation. The voids or sinkholes can form upstream within the central portion of the dam or on the downstream shell. The most critical location for a void to form is beneath the impounded water in the reservoir as this leads to a potential introduction of the full hydraulic head to more a more downstream location. Internal migration into rock defects is the most common scenario for USACE dams, where internal migration into defects caused um, in conduits is the most common scenario for USACE levees. There are a few other things to consider for this mechanism. The failure mode can develop very slowly over a long period of time. It can be very difficult to detect until the void progresses to the surface and is observable. Successful intervention is likely if the void forms above the water or is on the downstream slope. The first scenario of internal migration into open defects and conduits and drains will be discussed in the following slides. Here's the event tree for evaluating internal migration into conduits, pipes, or culverts. Node 1, the flaw node, an open defect exists in the conduit, pipe, or culvert. Node 2 is the initiation node. Downward gradient exists to initiate internal migration. There also has to be enough water flow in the pipes to transport the eroded particles. Node 3 is the continuation node. An unfiltered exit exists that allows erosion to continue. Node 4 is the progression node. The leakage fails to clog and a stope develops. The common progression node of holding a roof applies to concentrated leak erosion and is not evaluated for this internal erosion process. Node 5 is intervention. Detection and intervention are unsuccessful. Node 6 is the breach node where uncontrolled release of the pounded water occurs. As water is impounded, a phreatic line develops and seepage forces are active in saturated soils around the conduit. Seepage can enter any defect in the conduit if the conduit has an interior pressure lower than the water in the soil's pores. If seepage discharging into a non-pressurized conduit has sufficient gradient and soils are erodible, soil particles may be carried with the flow. Internal migration will cause a void or sinkhole to develop. Defects can be caused in conduits by embankment settlement, which can lead to lateral spreading and subsequent opening of the joints. Differential settlement can cause joints to open. The photo on the left shows water seeping through a joint in the outlet works where differential settlement occurred. The joint had no longitudinal reinforcement across the joint and the mortar joint filling had cracked and deteriorated. On the right, we see a joint where soil particles are being carried into outlet works through the joint. Joint offsets can cause high negative pressures to develop at overhangs during high velocity flow within the conduit from the Venturi effect. Negative pressures can pull or suck surrounding soils into the conduit through the openings and voids can develop adjacent to the conduit. Continued loss of surrounding soil could lead to development of a sinkhole which could lead to breach if it were to connect to the reservoir. Conduits that get pressurized can force water into the surrounding earth fill. When the flow reduces, the water will seep back into the conduit, bringing soil particles with it. 
This process is cyclical and may take a long period of time to develop to the point that distress is observable. To prevent joints from opening, a control joint is used in reinforced casting plate conduit construction. Longitudinal reinforcement is continuous through the joint. A top right figure shows water stop that is placed across the joints of the conduit to stop the water from coming through the joint. The bottom right figure shows a photo of typical water stop used in conduit construction to prevent movement of water through the joints. To evaluate the likelihood of the soil being able to continue erosion through the defect, the defect opening size is evaluated similarly to a filter opening size. The joint opening size is compared to the D95 of the adjacent soil. If the joint opening size is greater than the D95, the probability of continuation is 1.0. If it is less, the probability of continuation can be determined using the constricted exit worksheet in the RMC filter evaluation toolbox for continuation. Pine Creek Dam is a case history of erosion into the conduit. Soft areas with low blow counts and a large void were found above the conduit. The figure shows the location of the soft zones in red and the large void in the green. The photo on the right shows leakage into the conduit. The project was remediated with a cutoff wall above the conduit, a drilled-in chimney filter, a downstream conduit perimeter filter, and a new steel liner. Internal migration can also occur due to erosion into drains that are damaged or not properly sized as filters. These can include relief wells, tow drain pipes, rock fill tow drains, and stilling basin under drains. All drain pipes should be inspected. Video inspection of pipes is essential to assessing the likelihood of having an open defect. Corrosion of metal pipes creates holes that become unfiltered exits. The photo on the right is an example of a corroded corrugated metal pipe at the Herbert Hoover Dyke. If you don't have information from a recent inspection, the Pipe Service Life Toolbox can be used to evaluate pipes with respect to having a defect present that can help assess internal migration through that defect. This tool should only be used when the existing condition of the pipe is not known from a recent inspection. The toolbox is the same procedure that is used in the levy screening tool and there is also some additional information in the recently published EM 1110-2-2902 conduits, pipes, and culverts associated with dams and levees. Here are some more and less likely factors. This table is from the Best Practices Manual and can be used to help assess the likelihood of open defects in conduits, pipes, culverts, or drains. It can be used as a starting put point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more and less likely factors to guide the subjective probability estimation. The factors in this portion of the table address material transport presence of seepage, presence of open cracks or joints, pipe characteristics, filter and drain characteristics, sinkholes or depressions, and structure under drains. The additional factors shown on this portion of the table address inspections, voids below or adjacent to the pipe, and location of the tow drains. Lastly, internal migration into defects in the foundation will be discussed in the following slides. Here's the event tree for evaluating internal migration into rock defects in the foundation. Node 1 is the flaw node. An open rock defect exists in contact with the embankment with sufficient void space or that daylight's downstream. Node 2 is also a flaw node, and it's a node that describes whether or not the foundation treatment is ineffective. Node 3 is an initiation node where a downward gradient exists to initiate migration into the defect. If the exit is downstream daylighting, there needs to be sufficient gradient to transport the particles to the exit. Node 4 is a continuation node. An unfiltered exit exists. Node 5, the progression node, the leakage pathway fails to clog. Node 6 is an intervention node. Detection and intervention are unsuccessful. Node 7 is the breach node where uncontrolled release of impounded water occurs. 
One way rock defects are commonly formed in river valleys is due to stress relief. Erosion that forms the valley relieves the in situ ground stress in the vicinity, causing a passive failure and results in the formation of the joints. This is very common in sandstone and shale geology. Vertical joints are typically oriented along the valley walls, thus creating upstream to downstream seepage path across the dam. East Branch Dam is a case history where valley stress relief fractures caused a major um, internal erosion incident with um, internal migration. This case history will be discussed in a separate presentation. The volume of the void um, that was created is basically the size of a school bus. Another mechanism for rock defects is karst, where defects are created by solutioning in the rock. This is an example from a rock quarry in Indiana. Freeman Dam in Kentucky is another example of this scenario. It is located in Elizabethtown in central Kentucky. Although the dam did not breach, the case clearly shows progression of the potential failure mode. The dam was 50 foot tall clay embankment with a cut off trench and tow drains. It was built in the 1960s. Significant seepage issues were not reported until March 1997 following a record pool. Increased drain flows, seeps, boils, and saturated areas were observed downstream of the dam. Following an extensive investigation of the seepage issues, a chemical grouting program was initiated in the spring of 1998. During the grouting program, a void was encountered within the cutoff trench that extended up 11 feet into the core from the top of the rock. The volume of the void was approximately 135 cubic feet. The dam was breached and the foundation was exposed, revealing solution features present beneath the dam. Clearly, infilled soil in the solution feature had eroded over time, providing an open conduit for seepage to carry off the core material. It was noted that no dam or foundation soils were ever observed on the surface or downstream of the dam. Foundation conditions revealed in, in excavations led to a decision to completely remove and rebuild the dam with proper cutoffs, rock treatment, and filters. This map shows areas where certain rock types that are susceptible to dissolution in water occur. These rock types are evaporites like salt, gypsum, and anhydrite, and carbonates like limestone and dolomite. Evaporite rocks underlie about 30 to 40 percent of the USA, though in many areas are buried at great depths. This slide demonstrates how karst is formed from carbonate rock. As rainwater passes through the atmosphere and soil, it picks up CO2, which then dissolves into water to form weak carbonic acid. This acid then seeps into the rocks and dissolves the calcium carbonate limestone. Structure is important for karst development. Karst is opportunistic. Water flows along pre-existing cracks, faults, or joints. Dissolution is normally worse near the surface. As water works deeper, it's calcite concentration goes up and becomes less aggressive. Rock foundations that consist of evaporite rocks like gypsum are potentially more problematic than limestone due to the rate of dissolution. Mosul Dam in Iraq is a good example where grouting has been ongoing since its completion to treat the continuous deterioration of the foundation. Here's a map of core of engineer structures in karst regions. About 25% of all core structures are in mapped carbonate regions. Here's a list of some key considerations when evaluating karst. Karst initially develops along joints, faults, or bedding planes. Groundwater and environmental conditions that form the karst may no longer be present. For instance, they could be modified by glaciers. Subsurface water flow directions may be unrelated to the surface water flow direction. Karst can be open or infilled. Karst infilling can have different sources. It can be alluvial soils, glacial soils, residual soils, organic, or even junk. Infilled soil and karst may have very low confining pressure. Voids are likely connected since they were formed by drainage. There are three primary issues with dams on karst. The first is excessive leakage of the reservoir water. 
The second is transmission of high pore pressures to the downstream foundation. And the third is internal migration into a void or concentrated leak erosion along the soil void contact that leads to a sinkhole development or collapse or connection to the pool. When evaluating the first node of the event tree, consider the following factors. Is the geological environment likely to have open or infilled continuous features? What is the topography of the dam site? How steep is it? What is the valley depth? What is the continuity and orientation of the defects from the surface mapping of the embutments? Is there blast-induced damage of the rock foundation for a dam cutoff or conduit trench that could also lead to defects? Construction photographs and mapping are often the best guide to find whether such features may exist and their likely continuity and opening size. Do not consider cutoff elements at this point. Effectiveness of foundation treatment is a separate note. This table is from the Best Practices Manual and can be used to help assess the likelihood of open defects in the foundation. Generally, open defects in the foundation are associated with rock foundations. However, open, gravel, open work gravel foundations pose similar issues for internal migration as well as soil contact erosion. This table can be used as a starting point but the risk team must develop project-specific more and less likely factors to guide the subjective probability estimation. Note 2 of the event tree evaluates the effectiveness of any foundation treatment. Effective foundation treatment isolates the embankment from the foundation and its open defects. Assess the effectiveness of dental concrete, foundation shaping, removal of fractured rock blocks and overhangs, air hand cleaning, slush grouting, concrete bulkheads, filters at the embankment foundation interface, seepage barrier and cutoff elements. Be wary of reliance on grouting to serve as a sole design feature to control seepage. Consider information in the foundation report, construction photos, geologic mapping, asbelt drawings, performance and instrumentation. This table from the best practices manual can be used to help assess the likelihood of foundation surface treatment and foundation grouting not being effective. It can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific more likely and less likely factors to guide the subjective probability estimation. These tables from Fell and others in 2008 can be used to help assess the likelihood of grouting or cutoff walls not being effective. The factors for grouting address orientation of the grout holes compared to the open defects, quality of the grouting, and performance in relation to pore pressures and leakage. The factors for cutoff walls include the width and depth of the cutoff wall relative to the defects, performance in relation to pore pressures and leakage, and the quality of the cutoff. These tables can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more and less likely factors to, get to guide their subjective probability estimation. For sinkholes to develop, a downward vertical gradient into the rock foundation is needed. Evaluate piezometers and seepage analysis to show patterns of what could happen if rock voids are present beneath the dam. Pore pressures are likely low in the downstream side because the solution feature is acting like a drain. Lowering of piezometers can be an indication of karst drainage. This slide summarizes the conditions for sinkhole development. Conditions for sinkhole formation include open voids or slots in rock large enough to develop initial soil void at soil rock interface. Flow in the rock mass sufficient to wash away the collapsed soil materials so the void can enlarge. Downward seepage flow gradient across the void roof that causes raveling of the soil void roof and causes stoping to progress. Some things that will accelerate sinkhole formation include lowering of the groundwater table below the void roof, increase in the downward hydraulic gradient, a cyclic rise and fall of groundwater above and below the roof of the void, and surges from changes in tailwater elevation. Here are a few examples of sinkholes on or near dams. On the top left is Salicola Dam, an NRCS dam in Georgia. On the top right is Clearwater Dam, this is where a sinkhole developed on an upstream slope of the, of the dam above the pool. 
This happened after a record pool. It was believed that the sinkhole developed below a dental treatment area through a karst feature that was originally filled with soil, but over time it was cleaned out by erosion. On the bottom left, uh, in the early 1990s, seepage through the left abutment rim at Center Hill increased and discharged a very large volume of soil, about 5,000 cubic yards, into the downstream channel. This was followed by development of numerous sinkholes on the left abutment, and this photograph is one of those. At the bottom right, after 17 years of operation in 1968, sinkholes developed at Wolf Creek Dam near the switchyard at the downstream toe. Here are some observations made from sinkholes on dams. The process appears to be cyclical related to the rise and fall of the reservoir or tailwater. Most sinkholes were cover collapse type sinkholes near the crest or on the downstream side of the embankments. This may be related to where the gradient direction becomes downward into the dam foundation. Collapses have been sudden without signs on the surface, visual signs. Muddy flows sometimes are associated with the sinkholes and sinkholes rarely led to failure due to the successful intervention. To summarize this mechanism, this side presents an example from the Mosul Dam Risk Assessment of a sequence of events that would lead to failure. First, a continuous network of interconnected fractures and voids are present within the main valley dam foundation. Treatment of the foundation during and after construction was ineffective in cutting off or isolating embankment core from the underlying defects. Erosion of the overlying soil initiates into the open rock defects below and a void begins to form in the embankment core. A network of defects and interconnected voids through the foundation are sufficiently open and seepage passes through these features with sufficient energy and velocity to continually transport the eroded soil. Eroded core material is either transported to a daylighting downstream exit or is accepted by interconnected void space in the foundation rock. Erosion continues and progresses as upstream zones fail to choke off the stoke development. Void enlarges and manifests as a sinkhole that reaches the reservoir. Detection and intervention are unsuccessful. Erosion and material transport continue and enlarge, enlarges the sinkhole until crest collapses and the dam breaches. This concludes this presentation and now we have some time for questions. Thank you for your attention.